All right, boys and girls, what's up? BQ back up again in the place to be. This is your Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling review from June 20th, 2024. PCO went on a date with Steph Delander. Lots of heels got knocked on their ass. No heat. Uh, what do we have at the end of this show? We, we you know, we had a we had a a quick cameo appearance by by Matt and Jeff Hardy in there. Um End of the show was Josh Alexander, Eric Young in the main event. So lots to talk about here. There was um I, I thought the episode was a bounce back episode. That's for me personally. You guys may have liked last week's episode with the um House Hardy stuff and all that. You may have liked that stuff. I'm just speaking for me personally. I didn't enjoy the episode for whatever reason. I just don't like their go home episodes. I just never do. Uh so for me, this was kind of a bounce back. There's there's always misses. It's always hits and misses every episode. You know what I mean? They're not going to fire on all cylinders for the entire thing. But, you know, um, for the fo for the most part, I was entertained. You know, I, I so, uh, you know, I don't have I, I don't think I have too much negative to say about it, uh, <laughs> at least to my recollection. I guess we'll know when uh, I go through the notes. But, uh, yeah, last week's episode, I, I just didn't like it. I don't know that I praised anything on the entire show. Uh, but again, it was just kind of my my personal taste. You know, I'm not trying to sit here and tell you uh, you should dislike the Hardy stuff. I just didn't like it. Um, I wanted to. I just didn't. Um, so a couple of things I'm going to go into here first. So on Twitter, I posted this. I don't know if this guy is a subscriber to my channel or not. I have no idea. I don't recognize the name. But this was off the, the TNA YouTube. And he had said, may I suggest the team name of Masha and Alicia being called a militia. So I tweeted that um, on 26 May and said, I saw someone on the TNA YouTube say this, and I tagged both women. Uh, Alicia is not, Alicia is not a, like, she doesn't seem to check her mentions much, but uh, I've had pretty good luck with her checking when I tag her. Uh, but Masha 100% did see this tweet, and she liked it, and... Uh, these guys are now these girls, I should say, are now the militia. So um, I give this guy all the credit in the world. I'm sure he's watching the show. Like, oh my god, that's what I said. Uh, but I, I, uh, I feel like uh, <laughs> they came they came across my tweet where I show this uh, this screenshot here of this um, young man or woman, and uh, I think they ran with it. So. I was also going through my, uh, I don't know what I was looking for on my Twitter followers. I had a screenshot. This is for you motherfuckers. Oh, TNA doesn't care what you have to say. You're nothing. You're nobody. The the, the comments that I get sometimes, like, come on. I could I could screenshot this kind of shit all day. It's not, it's not um, bragging by any stretch of the imagination. It's just like, again... Those of you in the comments saying TNA doesn't care about what you say, you're too negative. Why are these people following me? Um, yeah, man, let's get into this. Let's get into this impact review. Uh, actually, you know, before I get into that, we're gonna talk Joe Hendry real quick because I, I did a, a separate upload already about it. People are very upset with Joe Hendry's elimination, and I I do my best to get you guys to not think like wrestling fans. And I don't mean like pro wrestling fans. I mean fans of the act of wrestling inside a ring. You have to think bigger than that sometimes. Joe Hendry, I think the Twitter stuff's like at 11 million views right now. He's over. There's demand for Joe Hendry. That's what matters at the end of the, the, end of the day. The best case scenario for TNA happened. I've even reached out to them on this because I, I wanted to like confirm that my thoughts were were similar to what they were thinking. They're not going to give people Joe Hendry right away. You know what I mean? Like they're thinking the same thing that I'm saying to you guys, millions of views, people talking like JBL tweeted like, Oh my God, I'm going down a rabbit hole of this guy's stuff. This guy's great. Like people are talking about this guy. That is what fucking matters. Not that shit that happens inside the ring between the ropes because if that was the case AEW wouldn't have dipped to 500,000 viewers this past week okay it's not 
yes, the wrestling matters, and that's why Frankie Kazarian was in there. But this was about getting the Joe Hendry character over. And again, there's there's now a big demand for the guy. They're not gonna, you know, if you want to see Joe Hendry wrestler wrestle, tune into fucking impact. You know what I'm saying? Like it's it, you guys gotta think a little bit bigger than that sometimes. Um, but I, I've seen the majority of people very upset with the elimination. I was not. And uh again, I reached out to the company and they had the same exact way of thinking that I did or that I do. So just calm your tits, people. Um, let's get into the show and our kick out. You know what? I admire those of you who don't get it as annoyed as easily as I do. I'm watching the episode. I just hear and our kick out every fucking five seconds. And um, again, I, I admire those of you who aren't, who aren't ignore, uh, annoyed by those kind of things like me. That's a me problem. It, it is. I acknowledge that. Uh, I'm not saying all introverts are like this, but me, it's one of my introvert traits. I'm just very easily annoyed by people. You know, if if I could, um, you know, that's kind of why I like living in, in, in Southern Illinois. Like if I could live in a fucking cabin in the middle of nowhere with just my family, I'd be the happiest. I'd be a pig in shit. You know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> I just get, I get very, uh, very, very annoyed easily, and I, I understand that's a me problem. But um, not kick out. Okay, let's seriously get into the episode now. Again, for me, this was kind of a bounce back episode. Uh, just last week's, I had a lot of issues with, and I had some in, in issues with this one too. I always do, right? So um, this kicks off with the system. They're coming out, and they're just you know, I appreciate that they just come out looking like stars. I talked about, man, was it my last impact review? No, it was when I was reviewing um, Against All Odds. The show that we just saw? Whatever show we just saw. When I was reviewing it, I was kind of saying that wrestling benefits when, when the show has a cool factor to it, the wrestlers have a cool factor. Guys come out looking cool, looking like stars. Moose is cool. Uh, Brian Myers to me is kind of borderline. It, it's hard to put him in that category because he's kind of a career jobber. Uh, I don't particularly find Eddie Edwards cool, but he looked cool, you know. Um, but but some of the guys I was using an example, Mike Santana, uh, Steve Macklin, you know, there uh, TNA has a, a few people that I would consider Chris Bay. Like these are these are cool people. Um, a lot of wrestlers are just you know, nerds playing the part of cool people on TV. But my my point is just the more people you can get on on screen that just that have that factor about them uh, that look like stars. I think that just benefits your your product overall, just from a visual standpoint. You know, that's why I give Jake something such a hard time walking around in his underwear backstage at all times because I'm like that's that doesn't look like a star. You know what I mean? I see a, a, a group like this, like the system come out dressed the way they are. And I'm drawn to that. You know, I'm drawn to people who are putting some effort into their appearance. Eddie Edwards with the hat. I don't know what those hats are called. I wanted to say it was a derby hat at first, but that's not correct. Um, I don't remember, but it was a very good look for him. And it makes him look cool, you know? So I just, I just kind of uh, appreciate that stuff. Uh, you you guys know when the uh, Grizzly Young Vets were were with TNA for a little bit, I said these guys don't do anything for me. Uh, I just felt like they were just any other tag team you see anywhere else. But then when they start kind of throwing on the suits backstage and rubbing elbows with Ali, I was like, okay, these guys look like stars, and I was I was just more drawn to that. So I appreciated this being an opening segment as opposed to um, a couple weeks ago when Jordan Grace was on NXT. And then the following episode of Impact is Big Con coming out. You know what I mean? Like, there's such a big difference between let me check out TNA this week because I saw what happened on NXT and and Con comes out in a flannel, uh, or the system comes out and they're draped in gold and they're dressed like a million bucks. You know what I mean? And there's some familiar faces as well. So, uh, I guess kind of my knock on this was that it was too long. 
I thought it took forever to get to the point. You know, Alicia started talking at first and then Eddie started talking and they were they kept pausing for the the crowd, but I didn't hear the crowd. This this was a, a television crowd, so it's never gonna be as hot as the you know the pay-per-view crowds, but I didn't hear the booing that that they apparently heard. I could be wrong, you know what I mean? Uh the camera was showing a few people in the crowd, and by a few people, I mean they kept showing the three same like two faces over and over which was really annoying. Um, but they showed people booing. You know, they were smiling and booing, but they were booing. So so maybe there was where they, they were making some noise. I didn't hear it personally. So it was kind of annoying that they just couldn't get to the point and start talking. And the thing was, Dango was, was not just hanging out in the background. Like he was dancing around and gyrating and doing all that stuff. So it was, it was to the point where I was like, yo, can we hear from this guy? Or can we hear what's... What's going on? I thought I thought the this entire thing was too slow. I appreciated appreciated them starting off with the system, um, you know, them dressing in suits and looking good and giving us a little backstory on Dango's connection with these guys. Because I think I had said it when I was reviewing the TNA Plus show. I was like, "What is Dango's connection to these guys?" I was like, "What's his connection to to Nemeth and to?" Uh, to Eddie and it, it just felt really out of left field and, and they were able to tie those things together a little bit. Um, they're going to call him Johnny Dango Curtis, which sounds like shit. That is awful. Like when he was dirty Dango and the, well, he's always been dirty Dango, but when he was helping Santino and then he attacked Santino and kind of rebranded himself, I thought he should have became dirty. I mean, excuse me, uh, Johnny Curtis at that point. I thought that would have just fit the gimmick better. Um, and I think it would fit fit him better now if he was just Johnny Curtis. Like the JDC is kind of catchy, but Johnny Dango Curtis sounds really fucking stupid. So um, I'm sure I'm sure we'll get used to it. Maybe you guys don't think it's stupid. Maybe again that's me just uh, being annoyed very easily. But I don't think that's a, a, a I don't think that name sounds good. But I, I'm sure I'll get used to it. The JDC thing works. That's a you know people with the three initials. They've been able to. The brand, that kind of uh, thing for years. Santino comes out and, you know, I've said many times that I liked his comedic gimmick in WWE. It just does not click in this role because he is forced to speak so much more than he was back then. When you're, when you're someone who can create a fake accent, you can only do it in small spurts. I've talked about this before. Like, um, he's he's in in order to hide that that's a, not your real accent is what I'm saying. Like, you have your certain phrases and your certain sentences that you can get out, but he's forced to say too much now. And there's his English comes out in about thirty percent of what he's saying. You know, it, it's. He is forcing the Santino gimmick. Um, I would just, I would just prefer a, a more serious authority figure, but you know, whatever. He comes out and it says he's come up. He he always has these ideas, and the ideas stink. But he has come up with something called the Road to Slammiversary. Real fucking original. This goes back to when I say present wrestling different. Okay, road to WrestleMania, road to Slammer. I mean, come on, that's real. That's all, all you had. Like, I'm not saying I have a better idea off the top of my head, but there were. He was announcing there's going to be a, a six way elimination match at Slammiversary. I'm sure you can throw Slam the the terminology of survival and Slammiversary in there and come up with something a little more original than the road to Slammiversary. Um. So what he announces is that there's going to be a series of qualifying matches and there's going to be a six way. So this is the formula of we're going to go to a pay-per-view, get as many people on there um, instead of just having Moose deal with one opponent at a time. You know, he's not going to wrestle Josh. He's not going to wrestle Nick. He's not going to wrestle Jeff Hardy. Um not going to wrestle Santana. Not going to wrestle Joe Hendry. He might wrestle all of them. I don't think Jeff Hardy was one of the qualifying matches, but 
I, I don't have a lot of it. I, it's one thing to have a six-way match. It's another one for it to be an elimination match. And I prefer elimination matches to get that out there, but not when it's your top six contenders. You, you shouldn't... S- you shouldn't see these guys lose and you shouldn't see them pinned at all. If if you're trying to build them up to like, hey, Bound, Bound for Glory is going to roll around. Um, you know they defend the titles at every damn show. So if the world champion has to defend it every single month, like you just kind of want some fresh opponents instead of just throwing everyone at them at once. It, it was almost like, to me, it's lazy to just say, hey, instead of building up one opponent, let's just give them, give them all all the opponents let's give them everybody uh but that's i i don't for me it's lazy i don't think they're being lazy because in their mind they're just trying to get everyone on the show you know i i think shows suffer from that mindset i think wwe proved that for a very very long time and they even scaled back on even with wrestlemania being two nights they don't shove everyone on the show like they used to you know because it, it, it dilutes the um dilutes the uh the the product and the overall effects of the show and then santino says moose you want to pay attention to this one it's josh alejandro whatever he calls him versus eric young in the main event tonight he didn't say that this was a qualifying match or anything like that so i was like why does moose care about this match josh alexander is the number one contender why is he in this I've talked uh, I talked quite a bit about that bullshit fucking impromptu street fight in civilian clothes that he had this match he had with Frankie Kazarian that I, I kept saying was very unnecessary to have. We didn't need to establish a number one contender back then. You know, it came off extremely forced. Like, let's get Josh back in the main event. Like, Josh is a great wrestler. No one's asking for him to be the champion again right now. Like, wait till we get there and people are like, okay, it's time. The fans are like, hey, it's time for Josh to be a champ again. Like, no one's saying that. Nobody. So I just thought that was, it was really, really forced um, to do that. And now they're acting like it didn't happen. So he has to qualify all over again uh, to to wrestle in this world title match. So they very easily could have just said, hey, Josh is already qualified. He beat Frankie Kazarian, and then you just go with the other four matches. You know, you know what I'm saying. But um, so yeah, the road to Slammiversary, very, very, very original. ABC cuts a promo backstage. They look like they're back on the same page. I hope that that is how it is going forward. I hope that they're course correcting. Uh, but they did say they're going they're going to wrestle one more match before they try to wrestle for the titles. So, <coughs> excuse me. Wow. Um, so we'll see what happens. I really hope they don't go this breakup angle. I don't necessarily want them in the title picture. You know, we got to freshen things up, but they don't need to break up. I was starting to think watching this episode. Because another thing that obviously, not obviously, but another thing that annoys me about Tom Hannafin is about nine times a show, he lets you know about the contractually obligated rematch. And I'm watching this, and I'm like, does everyone have a fucking rematch on this show that they haven't used yet? Now, part of me um, is glad that they didn't exercise them right away because I've I've always said, man, like, it's like someone will drop a title of the pay-per-view, and then they'll use their rematch the next episode. Like, they don't drag anything out, which, so this is, they are dragging it out. I just make make want to make that clear to um so then I'm not hypocritical. Like I, I acknowledge that they're not just throwing these people right back in the title picture. But the problem is I don't think anyone wants to see ABC wrestle for the titles right now. Not that people aren't a fan of them, but they just want something fresh. Like I think people enjoy the system being the champions more than ABC personally. Even even if the ABC may have more fans. I just mean it's more fresh what they're doing right now. I don't think anyone's trying to see Spitfire wrestle for the titles again. You know, um, no one's really trying to see Laredo Kid wrestle for his title again. I'm trying to think who who else might be up in here. Who's the X Division champion right now? Oh, Ali. Well, he's been the title champion for a while. 
I'm just saying, I don't think people care about that. I don't think people want to see these matches. Um, I'm just, I've never been a fan of the contractually obligated rematch. I just haven't. I've just, I grew up, for those of you who are a little older, kind of grew up, someone dropped his title. Fuck, he's kind of back at the end of the line. You know what I'm saying? Like there wasn't, there wasn't a, a, you know, a bunch of rematches all the time. It was kind of like they just had a way of keeping things fresh. So I'd rather they just keep things fresh personally, but I do acknowledge that they're not just throwing these people into their rematch right away. I just don't want to see it. I don't want to see Spitfire wrestle for the titles. I don't want to see ABC do it. I don't want to see Laredo Kid do it. I don't care. I don't want to see that at all. But hopefully they just keep ABC intact. I just want to see them just do something on something else for them to do. You know, Frankie Kazarian, they show him after NXT um, coming, cutting out, he's kind of cutting a little promo calls Joe Hendry, a corny ass one trick pony. So I thought that was funny. Then we got Spitfire versus the hex. I was surprised to see the hex here again. I figured after uh, against all odds, which I think that was the show we just watched. I, I thought I figured they were gone. So they kind of still got them around here for a little bit. I still, I haven't asked, uh, Allison K-, K directly. I may, I, I may in a couple weeks from now. Um, I try not to get into contract stuff too much, but I haven't asked her directly. I I don't feel like they're signed or going to be around because they they lose every single week. You know what I mean? They're 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 not coming across like a team that they're they're keeping around and trying to do something with, which is crazy because they're the best women's tag team division uh excuse me best women's tag team in wrestling in my opinion or at least unsigned so that and even i just don't know what the teams are at wwe necessarily but like this is one of the best female tag teams in the world and they they just show they just show up on tna and they just do jobs and allison k is like a former knockouts champion i think she's a two-time champion Marty Bell has a history of being a former knockout. Like, it's really crazy they just come in and do these jobs. This match was okay. The the, the uh, Spitfire's finisher looked like shit. That, was, that did not look good at all. But Marty Bell had to... I mean, they slammed her like a sack of shit, uh, and she had to sell it, and, and, and Spitfire won here. So, no uh, Lars Fredrickson here. I don't know what... They're they're just trying to take a slow burn up until their rematch, which is fine because they have they lack so many teams that it's okay. I'm just saying I don't want to see it. But when you when you lack teams, I've been critical in the in the past where they just keep having the the knockouts tag team champions wrestle so much that they run out of opponents. Like that's why I was a proponent of. Alicia and Masha winning because I was like, they can probably get away with them not wrestling very often for quite some time. And that's what they've been doing here. So eventually we're going to get this match and um, hopefully uh, Masha and Alicia win. And Masha and Alicia, um, they have a very weird dynamic. Like they're, they're teasing dissension for some reason with them, which is, I guess, their their favorite thing to do right now. But like on social media, their buddies, when they actually wrestle, they don't seem to have that issue. It's like the backstage stuff or when Brian Myers bumped into her by accident walking, not by accident, bumped into her on purpose walking past her last month. Like it's 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 a really weird dynamic. I wish I knew what she was saying in Russian. Uh, if anybody knows, fill us in. Because I don't under, I don't really understand what they're doing. Then they have a digital exclusive. They're doing a lot of these digital exclusives, and they're you know they're not bad. Um, the problem is, well, I'll get to that here in a sec. Matt Hardy was not in character here. He was not broken, Matt Hardy, which was really interesting. I don't know if they're going to go Hardy's versus the System at Slammiversary, or they may go a six way, or three way, three way. No, six six man. That's what I meant to say. It might be a mixed six man tag. Probably not. Um, that sounds that sounds more like a uh, TNA Plus match, but I think they said Rebby is going to be wrestling. So 
Her versus Lisha may be the worst match in TNA history though. So we'll see what, what they do to, to church that up by the time that happens. But yeah, these little digital exclusives, they're doing backstage work that is more reminiscent of the spy camera they used to use that Eric Bischoff, you know, came up with back in the older TNA days, which I always thought looked really good. They're starting to, to use elements of that. Um, from a TV production standpoint, I thought the show looked okay. The camera cuts look like shit this episode. I don't know what was going on. Just really sloppy camera cuts. And they have this new angle where they're like up the wrestlers' noses. They they just zoom up on their face. They were doing it when uh, Santino was talking, when Moose was talking. And then some of these backstage segments, I, I don't know what they're trying to accomplish with that. It does not look good. It looks awful. But, um, you know, again, some some really poor camera cuts, but visually the show is looking better. And these digital exclusives are a nice touch because they're they come across more real. There was no Gia Miller backstage with the interview was saying, you know, Ace Austin next week on Impact, you face so and so. What are your thoughts on this? You know, like just the the backstage interviews that. I always, you know, I felt they, I felt like they're unnecessary. I, I, I think I've said like WWE did it once upon a time. So now everyone's like, Hey, we have to do backstage interviews. Like they're not, this is more effective for me. I like these a lot better, but I just thought it was interesting that Matt Hardy was not in character for this. So it looks like we're really not going to get a lot of the broken Hardy stuff. I don't think we're going to get, Brother Nero, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think they're going to try to be the Hardys. Just the what's it? What is their TNA name? Just the Hardys, right? Because they're the Hardy Boys in WWE. I think they're just going to be the Hardys. It, it kind of seems like that's where they're going to go with it. That Matt's like, okay, I got the broken system off my chest. I mean, the broken, um, broken Hardy thing off my chest. We got the House Hardy match done. You know, like. It looks like he just wants to be himself. There's a certain shelf life on the broken gimmick if you don't deliver it properly. You know, so I don't know. It'll be interesting. At the end, he he goes over and then he almost corrects himself and says over. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll, fo- we'll see, folks. Then we got Alan Angels backstage doing his interview segment, which to me is always funny. Uh, he had a chair. <laughs> like a, a folding chair, something propped up on a box and it looked like absolute shit back there, but he's always like really proud of it, which is, which is funny. So he's talking to Kushida and Kushida speaks a little bit, bit better English than I expected, which is good. Like he's got to talk a little bit. Like if you, if you're signing the dude, it's one thing you're bringing guys from Japan to just do some matches. But if you've, if you've signed the dude, you know, he's, he's got to be able to speak a little bit. He said he's looking for the cure. They showed a lot of uh, clips from... He, he had a an octopus at one point and, and had ink. And I, I, I don't remember any of this stuff. I forgot we called it. It was like an eyedrop or whatever full of ink. I don't recall any of that stuff. I don't know where that, that stuff came from. But it showed him uh, helping Sammy Calorie Ham. Uh, the snack machine beat Jonathan Gresham on TNA plus. So Alan angels is so natural. And so he has so much charisma. Like I just wish they did more with him, but I think they're, I think they're doing a Kushida versus Alan angels next week. That's like what they're doing. Then we got Ace steel versus Frankie Kazarian in a Chicago street fight. You guys know, I hate street fights and no DQ and, and all that shit. I was watching this and um, my first reaction was that it's it's going on too long and that if Frankie can't beat Ace Steel with weapons, how is he going to beat Joe Hendry? You know what I'm saying? Like if, you, if you're just kind of looking at things from a logical standpoint, I know he beat Joe Hendry, but he cheated. But if you can't beat a non-wrestler and you have weapons at your disposal, like it's... 
it's hard to tie that into how is this guy going to win matches going forward, you know? So for me, it was too long. Uh, I don't know how I would have booked it, though, to be honest with you. But I remember a match that came uh, that came to me was that if you guys remember, man, this was on Pop TV. This was this had to have been nine years ago. There was a segment where Bobby Lashley was going to spear Josh Matthews in the ring, and the Pope got in the in the way and took the spear to protect him. So then the Pope, who is not really an active competitor, they announced next week, well, the, you know, Pope's going to wrestle Bobby Lashley. And like Pope got his ass kicked. Like the match barely w- was three or four minutes. And people wanted to see Pope wrestle. And they were kind of excited about the, the possibility, but the goal was to keep Lashley strong. And there was sympathy for Pope for getting his butt kicked. You know what I'm saying? And we don't do that here. The, the, we, or we don't get that in this current um, iteration of the company. This, the heels don't get heat. You know, um, AJ Francis, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. He was the only heel to go off screen with, with any, any kind of heat. Every other heel that uh, that won a match or whatever ends up on his ass after that. It's like 50-50, you know what I'm saying? The baby face comes out, gets comeuppance immediately, which is so weird leading up to Slammiversary that the baby faces keep finding a way to get over. Um, well, no, I guess I, I guess I can retract that because Ash by Elegance did, uh, did finally stand over Jordan Grace. Um, but I, I still stand what I say. I don't think, I just don't think there's enough, enough heat. And, uh, Frankie Gazarian, which t- it felt like it took him 15 minutes to beat a steal. And then when he's going to beat him down after the match, um, I wrote in my notes before anything even happened, someone he's going to attack him after the match. And he did. Uh, so he attacks him and Joe Hendry comes out and it's a, again, it's just an excuse to get Joe Hendry on screen. I get it. Um, but I would have rather Joe Hendry just ran him off. So Frankie leaves with some heat. You know what I'm saying? It's it just, they just don't, of course, Joe Hendry has to come in and hit him with a choke slam and all that stuff. The finish of this match was really dumb. The uh, slingshot where a steel was holding onto the chair. That was bad. Very, very bad. Then we get backstage Ali with Campaign Singh talking about the distorted audio. I love that they actually... Um, brought that up and they have a very good dynamic. I love that Singh was telling him that, you know, sir, the people need to hear from you. He's like, shut up, shut up. I have an idea. What if I spoke to the people? And he's just, uh, he's just repeating exactly what campaign Singh just told him. He's like, I'm a genius. Um, and they are referring to at TNA plus where they had, they tried to have the audio of him saying, I'm not really from Chicago and talking shit about the fans. It completely bombed. Like they had a good idea. I I commend them for it. It completely bombed. So we'll see what uh Ali's going to address the people next week. I think it was a state of the union or or something along those lines, but he is doing very good work and they have a lot of chemistry, these two. And then it shows PCO. I don't know the point of this. I don't know who this was for. PCO on his way to the date, they slow clap him in the hallway, but then he attacks one of them. I, I don't, I'm not sure what they're going for. Next was the PCO and Steph Delander date. This is the segment of the show that you either found entertaining or you thought it was very stupid. If I know TNA, it's probably all over their social media. Even though people who don't watch the show probably came across it and said, what the fuck is this? So they did. They had they had a date, and I was I was stating in previous weeks that I don't hate the angle because it's something a little bit different. But then I, but then I said, "Oh my God, they're going to go on a date, aren't they?" And I was hoping that they weren't. Um, I don't know if this is going a wedding angle. I I remembered back when Braxton Sutter 
went on the date with Laurel Van Ness. And um, that was more interesting because there was some stakes to the whole thing. They were trying to break him off from Allie. And they're also hot people. You know what I'm saying? They're good looking people. Uh, Braxton Sutter and, 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 you know, Chelsea Green, like they're, Braxton Sutter, a.k.a. The Blade, Pepper Parks, whatever. Like, these are good-looking people. Like, you could believe that they are they would be out on a date. And they at least tried to put him in some kind of restaurant setting, you know? They did a public date with ring entrances and commentary. Steph Delander looked good dressed like Elvira. I thought that was, that was a nice touch. But... The, I found it kind of entertaining when she was like, so what do you do for fun? And she's trying to talk to him and they're using microphones and, and PCOs just being PCO. I'm not going to say it wasn't entertaining, but it just, I felt like it was lazy television. If you're going to put people in the past and put them on dates and put them in a public setting, I mean, not a public setting. This was a public setting. I mean, uh, in a, in a fake restaurant or something like that, like do that. Like, what is, what was this? This is almost like, Hey, we don't have time to put him in a different setting. So let's just have a date in the ring with commentary and entrances. Like I thought it was, I thought it was really corny, but it wasn't, it wasn't a total loss. It's, it's just, I, I, I just couldn't get over the commentary and, and all that first class comes down. And, um, you know, attack PCO. I, I barely even remember what happened with them last week. I think they stole the the Black Rose, right? And then PCO got pissed. So it's it's kind of a silly angle. I guess we're going to get PCO versus AJ Francis, which I don't know if I really want to see that. I don't know how good that would be. And uh, they put Steph DeLander through the table, too. So AJ Francis choke slammed her, which was... Which was odd. Uh, it was also two choke slams in a row for for angles, by the way, uh, from the last match and this. I don't think you should be putting your. I'm okay with intergender wrestling. I am. If the if the wrestlers are cool with it, we should be too. That's the way I see it. Also, wrestling's fake. You know what I'm saying? But I don't think you should be doing a move where you've got your hands around a a girl's throat. Like to me, that's a little a little much. There's no reason you can't put her through the table, but slam her through, do something. You know what I'm saying? But I don't think putting your your hand around her throat is is appropriate. But they put SDL through the table, and Tom Hannafin is calling this like a wrestling match. And this is like some of the issues I have with him sometimes, and even with like modern commentary. He crashes this date. They take out PCO. They're they're putting their hands on a woman, and he's calling the wrestling moves. If this were like Gorilla Monsoon back in the day, I mean, he would legitimately come off, come across as outraged, like, get this guy out of here. What the hell is he doing? We need some referees out here. That was, that, that's not how Gorilla Monsoon sounded, obviously. But you understand what I'm saying. He would react like we would in real life. You, you know what I'm saying? Um, get, get this person some help. But he's calling the moves. Like we're watching a match. So that part made it to me just like come across like very, very fake. But I guess we're going to get Steph DeLander as a baby face now. Which makes sense why, why her and Zaya Brookside kind of rubbing elbows a little bit talking about the date. So... How how is this going to work when Matt Cardona returns? Are they going to? Some people even suggested maybe Vance Warner is a part of this, but it's weird because it almost looks like SDL is into it. You know what I mean? So it it, it is interesting. It it is. Uh, it's not a main event angle. It is kind of interesting because there's a few directions they could go with it. Like, is, is she really into it and it's a baby face turn or they doing this on purpose for um, Cardona to to come back and attack them again? Are we going to get like some kind of Vance Warner thing? I don't think so. Uh, who's her like real life boyfriend, I believe. So 
I don't know. There's a few di- different directions they can go here. I just thought doing a, a date for the fans was kind of kind of dumb. Uh, Tom Hannafin calling the moves, you know. But, you know, it's whatever. Then we get uh, Ash by Awful Sauce taking on Heather Reckless. So I'm familiar with Heather, Heather Reckless being an Illinois resident because I did go to several independent shows up in Chicago. Heather Reckless is better than Ash. <laughs> put, put this out there right now, okay? She is a better wrestler than her. You could probably tell that based off this match here. And even though I kind of make fun of people from week to week, every time some kind of female jobber shows up on the show, everyone starts tweeting, sign this girl, you know? Heather Reckless, I actually would tweet that and say, hey, sign Heather Reckless. I think she's very good. Uh, but she is better than Ash by Elegance. She had to actually wrestle down Ash by awful sauce. I'm sorry. She had to wrestle down to her level uh, for a lot of this. Ash does not get dominant victories. And uh, as I said, when I was reviewing the TNA plus show, I'm, I'm so out on her. I've, I've tried my hardest to, to hang in there. And I was just, you had this hot Chicago crowd and they knocked her on her ass and made it bad comedy. And I, I don't I just don't care at this point. I had said I don't care if she shows up. I don't care if she attacks Jordan Grace on the next episode. If she shoots her with a gun, like I don't buy the heat at this point. Like that was your opportunity. It it, it reminded me of I, I'd be shocked if if no one here has seen the CM Punk uh UFC match, his debut. But there's you know, there was a lot of build up to it. And then the bell rings and and you know, you hear him go, here we go. And the crowd is like really, really into it. And then the match is obviously over very quickly. But that was the vibe that I got when Ash entered the ring after she beat Paxley Tatum or whatever, Tatum Paxley, after Jordan beat her. And Ash got into the ring. That was the response from the people. The, the here we go, and everyone's like, "Oh shit, here we." You know what I'm saying? They got that kind of reaction when, when Ash and it entered the ring, but instead they didn't take advantage of it. Um, she got knocked on her ass, much like CM Punk did, and now the the uh, the air's out of the balloon. You know, you can't just. I don't know. I I, I don't want to repeat myself too much about it, but I just thought it was a a huge missed opportunity for her to go over Jordan and give her a very brutal beatdown in front of a very hot crowd. So here, uh, she wins the match. And of course, she's going to attack her after the match because that's just what they do on the show now. And then Jordan comes down. And at first, Jordan... Knocks her in her ass just like she had been doing. And then the personal concierge gets in the way. And, um, and, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. He, he got in the way. And then Jordan, uh, obviously turned his or her attention to him. And then Ash hits him, hits her with the belt, like they're trying to show continuity from NXT where Jordan hit her with the belt. So now Ash is hitting her by the belt. Like the moment is over. It is done. It is passed. You had your opportunity, did not take advantage of it. I don't care anymore. So obviously they're going this direction. I don't think people care. I don't think people even want the match. Um, But we'll see. I I reported to you guys that Artie Evans was the one in charge of this gimmick and that they've acknowledged backstage that the personal concierge has become the gimmick and they have to find a way to to bring him in, uh, rail him in a little bit. That's not the word. Uh, bring the reins in. We got to pull him in a little bit and allow Ash to shine a little bit more. That's not what this was. I didn't really see it with that, but um, we'll see. Of course, Tom was calling her reckless like that was her last name. And then uh, <laughs> I kind of laughed here because after she Ash hit Jordan with the belt and was standing over her, Instead of basking in the moment, they just cut to Tom Hannafin running down the rest of the card. <laughs> then we got Jordan back, Jordan Grace backstage. I think there was a, a commercial here, and then it showed her backstage, which was, again, too close. The camera's too close, but it was showing her 
upset, pissed, say, hey, we're going to end this once and for all. So they're going to have a wrestling match that people are just not asking for. Then we got uh, Johnny Dango Curtis, JDC versus Ryan Nemeth. So I had some interest in this because I wanted to see how uh, how Johnny Curtis came off here. And Ryan Nemeth is someone that they're getting behind a little bit. You know, he's got a, he's got a long way to go. I thought this match was okay. I thought Ray Walt calling the uh, top rope leg drop leg drop from the tease up of the Rizzo was very cringe, very unnecessary. I don't know why he did that. But if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, he was hitting his leg drop finisher from the top rope, and Ray Wall said, from the tease up of the Rizzo. Fucking cringe, dude. What the hell was that? And um, big shocker, he attacked him after the match. So I, I guess what I didn't talk about in the t- opening segment was that Moose was saying that Johnny Curtis is not in the system yet. So we'll see if he actually is a part of the system. It almost seems like they got to test him a little bit. He wins a match here. So, you know, we'll see if that's where they go with it. Um, but yeah, big shocker. He attacked them after the match as an excuse to get uh, Nick Nemeth out there. And, and again, it goes back to what I'm saying. Just lack of heat for the heels. I understand Jordan, Jordan, excuse me, not Jordan, but uh, Ash by Awful Sauce and AJ Francis looked strong. But why not have Frankie Gazarian and and Johnny Curtis look strong as well? Like we're going into a pay-per-view. Like, why not? Why does the baby face have to run down and, and scare him off, you know? Not even scare him off. I'm okay with him scaring off, but coming down and and whooping ass. The main event, I know it sounds like I'm being kind of negative. Uh I did like the show, believe it or not. Uh the main event was Josh Alexander versus Eric Young. I didn't watch this. Because I didn't care. Uh, I just knew that it was going to be a a very good long wrestling match that Josh Alexander was going to win. So I just fast forwarded. Um, I don't mind long matches when I don't know who's going to win. When I'm legitimately like, yo, who's going to win this match? I can watch a long match. When I I know who's going to win, I don't care. That's too much wrestling for me. Uh, but I just I just fast forwarded to the end of this thing. And uh, Josh Alexander won, as I expected him to be Eric Young. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what they do with Eric Young. I thought that they were going to try to just keep these guys as a tag team for a little bit, just to freshen things up with Josh. That's clearly not what they're going to do. I don't know what they're going to do with him. He's like, in 2024, he's just been the TNA rah-rah guy. You know, he had a nice thing going with Frankie Gazarian. That, w- that was actually very good what they were doing. But um, I don't know what they have for Eric Young right now. I have no clue what they would have this guy do at Slammiversary. None. So we'll see. But Josh um, advances to this six-way elimination soup sandwich at Slammiversary. The Slammiversary soup sandwich. And um, they announced they did announce some other announce some other matches, and they look like good matches. Like they're you you have an idea of who you think is probably going to win, but you know they they could throw a curveball at you. They're not. They weren't like real, real obvious winners in the matches. So uh, that's interesting. It actually shows a lot about what they've been able to accomplish accomplish with their main event scene to where they're finally starting to have multiple guys who can contend because a year ago, Johnny, Johnny Dango Curtis was in a number one contenders match for the world title, you know, and um, right now he's nowhere near that scene. So. Uh, but I know I pointed out a lot of negatives. I, I did think the show was pretty easy to watch. I, I thought it was solid overall. I thought it was a pretty good bounce back from last week. And they're trying some new things with the cameras and backstage. And, you know, again, I don't think the close-ups looks very good. Close-ups look very good. I thought the camera cuts look like shit. But doing the digital exclusives, the the sneaky cam where you're just kind of walking up on them talking instead of the promo starting exactly when the camera cuts to them, you know. They're doing some things here that I can appreciate. The show, the lighting looks better. You know, there's there's improvements I can appreciate. So that'll do it for me this week, folks. I'm your boy, BQ. I will talk to you again soon.